Fellow believers in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the one we know lived for others, and so by following him we also live for others. It's rather obvious to state, but the movies, the books, the stories that we like best are always stories in which good ultimately triumphs over evil. I mean, I can't remember the last time I enjoyed or saw or even heard of a story in which evil triumphed over good. I think part of that, of course, is just the natural yearning that all humans have for good over evil. I think also it's true that we like those kinds of stories, movies, and books because so often as we look around us in reality, it does not seem like good triumphs over evil. That in fact, it seems that evil always wins. And as believers in Jesus, we are not surprised because we need to remember that Jesus had promised us that as the world goes on and gets closer to the end, so also evil will abound. That's just the way of this world. But today, we have a chance to have God remind us that even though it may seem like evil wins out there in the world through our Savior Jesus Christ, We know that evil doesn't win in here. That, in fact, God has conquered evil with good. Not only for us, but yes, because of Jesus through us. We all know the cycle, the sad cycle of this world as human beings struggling. The cycle is this. When someone hurts or harms us, we seek to hurt or harm others. And then it is repeated again and again. And this happens, yes, with, um, among our friends, our co-workers, among strangers, among nations. But you also know that this happens among family. The vicious cycle of hurt following hurt, hate following hate. It's interesting isn't it, that as much as strangers or enemies might hurt us, that those whom we love and are closest to, that they're the ones that can hurt us the most or we can hurt them the most. The sad cycle. How do you break that? How do you break the cycle of hate following hate, evil following evil? Well, today we have an example of that. In our first lesson we read about Joseph, he was able to break that vicious cycle. He was really able to break it for two reasons, and we want to be reminded of that, that, that he understand that, that God was still with him no matter what evil would take place in his life. And he understood the power of forgiveness. Do you remember what happened to Joseph? And, and that lesson that we read was really just the tail end of a of a story of unfortunate harm and hate and hurt that occurred in the family of Joseph started really with his father Jacob who in his youth also caused hurt and harm to his family tricking his brother of his birthright having to flee for his life and then Jacob has 12 sons and he doesn't grow any better at not hurting his family. He plays favorites with his sons. Remember this? He plays favorites. Joseph was his favorite. Caused his brothers to be jealous of him. And Joseph wasn't innocent of this either because Joseph was given dreams by God. You remember that? And then Joseph would flaunt those dreams in front of his brothers so that there just was a bunch of hating and hurting going on in that family until finally the brothers resolved to kill Joseph. They don't kill him. They settle on selling him into slavery. His own brother is selling him into slavery. He makes it into Egypt. There he's sold to Potiphar. Laura's with him, blessed him in Potiphar's household, at least as much as you could be blessed as a slave. That is, until someone else does evil to him. That's when Potiphar's wife made advances against Joseph, and Joseph rebuffed her, and so then she lied about Joseph, said that he was the one that made advances against her. 
But Potiphar had had him thrown in prison, and he suffered in prison for many years. Again, hate following hate, hurt following hurt. The Lord was with them in prison, though. If you remember, it wasn't just now that political enemies are thrown into prison. There were some royal officials that were in that prison, too, and Joseph came to know them. And when Pharaoh had a dream that he could not understand, the Lord allowed Joseph to interpret the dream of Pharaoh that there was going to be seven good years, and then there was going to be seven bad years of famine. That's when Pharaoh exalted Joseph to be his right-hand man, second in command, and the Lord used Joseph to store up enough food during those seven years of plenty so that he could save lives during the seven years of famine. And then his brothers come. They too are starving. They too are in danger of dying. Then his brothers come to Egypt. They have no clue that it's Joseph that they are dealing with. They just think it's some Egyptian ruler. They come before Joseph asking for help. And here we go. What will happen? Will the cycle continue? Will Joseph hate his brothers, hurt his brothers, harm his brothers? No one would think anything of it if he did. We broke that cycle. An amazing account that we read about how he just couldn't help himself. He burst out, I am Joseph, your brother. And they were terrified of what Joseph was going to do to them. Was he going to send them packing, saying, no food for you, go and die, you deserve it? Was he going to send the guards in to have them arrested and put into prison, see how you like it? No. He gave them food. He helped them. And then he invited them to come and stay into Egypt, the land of Goshen, the best land that there was. Why would he do that? Well, as we read in Genesis, he did that because he understood a truth that no matter how many people would hurt or harm him, God would never leave him. God was always behind him. That, in fact, God would use that to accomplish good And that's exactly what happened. And that good that Joseph accomplished, even though there were many who hurted and hated him, reached far more than just the millions of people in Egypt and his own brothers. But yes, it eventually reaches you and me as well, because God had promised that through one of Joseph's brothers, the Savior, would come into this world. And if they were dying of famine and that line was wiped out, how could Jesus be born? But no, through all of the pain and misery, the long years of suffering at the hands of evil people, Joseph understood God was going to accomplish a good and he wasn't going to stand in the way. My dear friends, we have times when others hurt us, harm us, or we hurt and harm others. They break the vicious cycle. It's by recognizing that no matter who hurts you or harms you, who sins against you, no matter what evil you may have to deal with in your life, your God is always behind you. He will not abandon you. That, in fact, God will use even the evilness of this world to accomplish good. And we know this, of course, and we are amazed by it because we see that most clearly through Jesus, our Savior. If anything was evil and wrong, it's when the Son of God died on the cross because of evil men. And yet we know why God allowed that to happen and didn't stop it is because through that, God was going to accomplish the greatest good this world has ever known, the forgiveness of sins for all people through Jesus' suffering and death in our place. And we need to keep that in mind as we suffer those hardships and evil as people hate, hurt, and harm us. We need to remember that God hasn't left us or abandoned us, that God is always behind us. We know this because of his son, Jesus Christ, and that in some way he will turn it to our good. And more than that, we can break the vicious cycle of hate following hate, harm following harm, 
by remembering what Joseph remembered. That in the end, maybe the greatest good that God wants us to accomplish when others hurt or harm us is to forgive. After all, why didn't Joseph get back at his brothers or at least ignore them or walk away from them? It's because he forgave them. And in our families, those closest to us, we understand and we know full well how there can be friction and anger and that, in fact, they can hurt and harm us and we can hurt and harm them more than a stranger could or an enemy could. Parents and children butting heads. Co-workers, neighbors, friends. What do we do in those situations? How do you break the vicious cycle? Well, there's only one way, and that's to forgive them. But why should you forgive them? Why should you forgive someone who hurt you, someone who hates you? Why does Jesus say, love your enemies? Pray for those who curse you. Well, we know why we would do that. Because standing behind us is God's love and forgiveness, which he first displayed in our life as well. For as much as someone can hurt or harm us, we all know that we hurt and harmed God more by our sins, by how we failed him. We were God's enemies. We were unthankful. We were ungrateful. And what did God do? As we sang in the psalm earlier in this service, the Lord did not treat us as our sins deserved. No, in fact, the Lord forgave us. The Lord did not hold us accountable for our sins. No, the Lord held Jesus accountable for our sins. And why did he do that? Simply because he wanted to. He chose to. And that, my dear friends, is the power of Christ's love that stands behind you in your life. When the vicious cycle of hate following hate and harm following harm seeks to rear its ugly head, you can choose not to by choosing to forgive. Overcoming evil with good. It's a very practical thing. And I'll leave you with just one example that I heard of from a fellow pastor, which is quite telling and reveals a lot about the forgiving love of Christ that stands behind you. Pastor tells a, a story about what happened early on in his ministry. One of his members, an eight-year-old man, was dying of cancer, and there was no peace for this man. No matter how many times the pastor would tell him that Jesus loved him, he's going to go to heaven, the man said, no, I'm going to hell. I know this pastor. And finally, he just said, why? Why do you think this? I'm telling you of Christ. You know what he did on the cross. Why do you think you're going to hell? And that man finally admitted something he had kept secret for many years. That early on in his marriage, he was unfaithful to his wife. And he had kept that secret, never told a soul. He wasn't forgiven for that. The pastor encouraged him to finally be honest, to tell his wife what he did. And so she came into the room, and there that man confessed his sins on his deathbed to his wife about he was unfaithful to her. And as pastor tells it, when he was sharing this with his wife of 60 years, he could see the shock in her eyes, the sadness in her face. What would she do? How would she handle this? That was when the amazing thing happened. Leaning over the rail of the hospital bed that was in his room, she said, husband, I forgive you, but more importantly, Jesus does too. And he died shortly after that with the peace of forgiveness 
and was taken to heaven. Why could that wife say that? When obviously it was certainly hurtful to hear those words. It's because she knew and kept in mind the same thing that Joseph kept in mind, the same thing that you and I, dear friends of God, need to keep in mind as well. She had a perspective of something far more important, something far larger than just her her own personal hurt or harm, her own personal need for getting even or revenge. She saw that there was a soul that needed to be saved. My dear friends, when we get into those circumstances, even amongst our family and friends, when there is hate and harm and hurt out there, may we also have that same perspective. There's something larger going on than just our own personal hurts. There are souls out there that need to be forgiven. Who will do that? You will do that. Amen. May the peace of God, which goes beyond all of our understanding, guard and keep us through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. I invite the congregation to stand as we confess our faith according to the words of the nice.